muscle is one of those tissues that sets biomechanics apart from other branches of mechanics and to me is one of the most interesting cell and tissue types to study in, in biomechanics. There are three types, skeletal muscle, which is striated and voluntary, cardiac muscle, which is striated but involuntary, and smooth muscle, which is involuntary and not striated. Striated refers to the structure, the fact that the skeletal and cardiac muscles have a very well organized structure of their contractile proteins that gives rise to striations in the muscle structure that we'll see in a second. A really important difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is that skeletal muscle can exhibit a sustained contraction. We call that a titanic contraction, which is obviously important for the, the sort of functions that skeletal muscle is designed to do. Cardiac muscle cannot. Cardiac muscle can only twitch and then relax and twitch and relax, and that's the heartbeat. And it's equally important that cardiac muscle can't undergo a sustained contraction as it is that skeletal muscle can. Starting at the level of the whole skeletal muscle, we notice already, just like you see in a piece of beef, muscle is fibrous. It has a grain to it. And the grain follows the orientations of bundles of muscle cells, and those bundles are sometimes referred to as fascicles, and the fascicles are organized by the extracellular matrix. So there's a collagen matrix that surrounds these bundles of cells, as well as additional collagen that interconnects them. And that creates these bundles that, so even with the naked eye, you can see the grain of a piece of meat. That's because you're looking at the fascicles of the muscle. The muscle cells are also called the muscle fibers. So we talk a lot about muscle fibers, and technically a muscle fiber or a myofiber is a muscle cell. This gets a little confusing when we talk about cardiac muscle because, in fact, cardiac muscle cells are not very fibrous. They're fairly short. They're elongated, but somewhat short, so they're more rod-shaped. But we still call them fibers because a lot of the terminology that's used for cardiac muscle cells derives from the terminology that was invented for skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle fibers are 10 to 80 micrometers in diameter and can be very long. They're not quite as long as the entire muscle, but they can be over half the length of the muscle. They can be three quarters of the length of the muscle. As a result of that, they're really, really big cells, and so they're multinucleated. The prefix myo and sarco are often used in muscle. So the plasma lemma of the myocyte or muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is called the sarcoplasm. And there's a specialized endoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In addition, as you can see, even at the level of the fascicles and certainly at the level of the single fiber, the cells are very visibly striated, striped with a repeating period of approximately two micrometers of light and dark bands. That is because inside the muscle fiber are lots of myofibrils, hundreds or thousands of these, each about one micrometer in diameter, that are made up of overlapping and organized arrays of thick myosin filaments and thin actin filaments. The repeating unit along the length of the myofibril that gives rise to the striation period is called the sarcomere. In the sarcomere, I'm sure everyone's seen this diagram before in mammalian physiology, is this organized structure of overlapping thick filaments and thin filaments. Remember, the thick filaments are myosin, the thin filaments are actin. There are other proteins not shown in this structure that hold everything together. So there are intermediate filaments that will connect across the thick filaments to keep them aligned. The thin filaments join end to end at a structure called the Z-disc, which actually has a lot of proteins, including signaling molecules and cytos skeletal molecules localized to it. And in between, although the textbook pictures usually show the thick myosin filaments floating in between the thin filaments, there are actually proteins that do connect them as well. In fact, the, the largest single protein in the body, which is called titan, is that connects here at the Z-disc and then at the thin filament and then across to the thick filament and provides some resting elasticity. There are other important structures, of course, in the muscle cell, including mitochondria, 
here you see the mitochondria most, mostly localized under the membrane, but also between the myofibrils, the bundles of myofibrils. You can see that there are invaginations of the membrane that go deep into the myocyte called the T-tubules. So in other words, inside this gray is outside the cell. It's an extension of the extracellular space. The blue that you see here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which has the junctional sarcoplasmic reticulum very close to the T-tubules, and then the network sarcoplasmic reticulum diffusively spread around the myofibrils. There's a lot of mitochondria in muscle, particularly in heart muscle, which can never rest, because muscle does a lot of work and it needs to generate a lot of ATP to provide the chemical energy for that work. Each myofibril consists of about 1,500 thick filaments, which are about 20 nanometers in diameter, and 3,000 thin filaments that are about 6 nanometers in diameter, as I mentioned, surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcomere is divided into regions that have classical names. So I mentioned the Z-line or Z-disc, which is where the actin thin filaments anchor, and also where the membrane tends to have junctions with the myofibrils. So there's cytoskeleton that extends from the outer limits of the Z-disc that forms complexes in the membrane where extracellular matrix also ties in. This is the main reason why when you look at a muscle, you can see the striated pattern even across multiple cells, even across an entire fascicle or entire muscle. Because the extracellular matrix actually organizes the muscle fibers so that their Z-discs and their sarcomeres line up from cell to cell. So you, you can take a, a small muscle from a frog or a mouse, shine a laser beam through it, and actually create a diffraction pattern. Because this sarcomeric organization is not confined to within the cell. The cells are actually tied together within the fascicles and within the whole muscle to maintain that a registration right across the thickness of the muscle. But nevertheless, the sarcomere itself is an intracellular structure and it is classically divided into these uh, different bands based on histology. So the Z-disc that I mentioned, the one that goes down the middle is called the M-line. The dark region is called the A-band, and the A stands for anisotropic to polarized light, and the light region is called the I-band, which is isotropic to polarized light. You can probably tell, having seen the picture of the sarcomere, that the A-band is where the thick filaments are, the myosin filaments are, the I band is where the thin actin filaments are, but those thin actin filaments may also overlap to some degree or a lot with the A band. So here's the first question. When a muscle changes length, which of these bands changes length? The Z disc, does it change its length? The A band, the I band, or the M line? Because what changes when the muscle changes length is not the length of the filaments, but the amount of overlap. And the I band is the non-overlapping part of the actin, either side of the Z-disc. So here's an electrotransmission electron micrograph of the real structure. So here you can see different myofibrils, and you can see they don't line up perfectly, but the Z-lines uh, Z are in pretty close register. Here you see mitochondria in between those myofibrils. Here's the thick filaments, the M-line, and the I band C disc. This distance, this length, is about two to three micrometers skeletal muscle, about two micrometers when the muscle's at rest. It also happens to be close to the length when the force generated by the muscle is highest. So here's just another schematic of the same thing. We will talk about the sliding filament theory that posits that the way the muscle generates force is dependent on the overlap of those thick and thin filaments. Here you see a thick filament, thin filament, and you see this yellow it is shown connecting the Z-disc to the thick filament. Actually, it should also connect to the thin filament, and that's the titan. And titan is a very big coiled, coiled molecule, so it acts as a very sort of sloppy spring. But then there are different isoforms of titan, some of which are shorter than others, and some of which change their properties when they're phosphorylated. So that spring, which is relatively slack and compliant, can be stiffer if you have different isoforms or if you have post-translational modification. And when the muscle is not contracting, there are no interactions between the thick and thin filaments. The resting stiffness of the myofibril is due almost exclusively to the titan. The resting stiffness of the cell and the tissue depends on other structures that are in parallel, like the membrane cytoskeleton and then the collagen of the matrix. But for inside the cell, 
the main source of rest, resting stiffness is the titan molecule. The actin and the myosin thick and thin filaments are arranged in a hexagonal arrangement like this. So if you look at the point at the A-band region of the sarcomere where you have overlapping thick and thin filaments, you'll see that surrounding each thick filament are six thin filaments. And the thick filaments actually put out these heads called cross bridges in pairs that are 180 degrees apart. And each one of those pairs is rotated 120 degrees with respect to the previous one along the length of the thick filament so that by the time you've done a full 360 degree rotation, you have three pairs making six cross bridges that can form junctions with the neighboring six actin thin filaments. The actin filament is a double helix of F-actin, which is a filamentous actin made up of G-actin monomers. So you know actin is ubiquitous. F-actin are the filaments that get made when the G-actin molecules polymerize. There are a lot of molecules, actin interacting molecules, that regulate that polymerization and depolymerization. In muscle, they're designed to keep those thin filaments at exactly several hundred monomers long. But there are other molecules that are important on the thin filament in addition to actin. Mostly there is troponin. So there's three isoforms of troponin that all co-localize. Troponin C, which binds calcium. Troponin I, which is important in the linkage between troponin C and tropomyosin and the thin filament, and troponin T, which has a long portion that interacts with tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is a fairly elongated, stiff molecule that overlaps from end to end every, about every seven actin monomers so that you get this continuous tropomyosin strand that's tied around the thin filament. And at every seven actin monomers, you find this complex of troponin I, T, and C to which calcium combined. And we'll talk a little bit more about the activation in a minute. The thick filament is made of myosin. And I mentioned how the myosin has heads. And these heads are the so-called S1 domain of the myosin, is the part that interacts with actin. So these terms, heavy myosin and light myosin are somewhat out of date now. People don't use them so much anymore. But there is a light chain region, a heavy chain region, and then there's the region that interacts with the whole thick filament. What you can see, though, is that, and actually this diagram doesn't show it very well, is that the heads actually protrude out in opposite directions from the thick filament 180 degrees apart from each other. There are about 50 pairs of cross bridges at each end of the thick filament, so for each half sarcomere. And the filament, as I said, makes a twist of approximately a full turn every three pairs, with a 14.3 nanometer interval between the pairs, which is just a little bit greater than the distance between those adjacent, uh, those repeating regulatory units of troponin along every seven monomers along the actin filament. Next, in skeletal muscle, the way skeletal muscle gets activated is by nerves. And one nerve fiber or cell doesn't necessarily activate one muscle cell. One nerve fiber or cell can activate one or two muscle cells or a larger group of maybe as many as 100. And that group of the nerve and the muscle cells that are activated by it is called the motor unit. And the nerve terminal has a termination which is like a specialized synapse very close to the muscle cells. So this one nerve cell will have a bunch of these so-called uh, end plates terminating on all of the muscle cells within its motor unit. This specialized synapse uses a neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine, to tell the skeletal muscle cell to contract. So the signal isn't electrical. There's a, an action potential that travels along the nerve cell, and then there's another action potential that will travel along the muscle cell to activate it. But the coupling between them is chemical. And it uses the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which, as I'm sure you know, is released from um, synaptic vesicles at the end plate. The acetylcholine has to travel a very short distance, just nanometers, across this cleft to bind to receptors, acetylcholine receptors, that when they bind acetylcholine, produce a slight depolarization of the membrane. And if enough of them trigger, you produce what's called a miniature end plate potential. And that can be enough to then trigger a depolarization of the muscle cell that then spreads along the whole length of the muscle cell and, and will trigger the contraction of the muscle cell. But 
the nerve to muscle coupling is actually a chemical one, and that is called the neuromuscular junction. As you probably also know, what's equally important is not only the release of the acetylcholine, but the degradation of it, and that is so that you can get a good frequency response. So it's very close so that the activation is fast, but then it also has to be almost as soon as that acetylcholine is released, it's got to be degraded again so that you can do a new release because frequency is used to modulate the strength of muscle contraction. And uh, what degrades that acetylcholine is the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. Now what actually switches on the myofilaments, as I mentioned, is calcium. So the result of the action potential in the cell is that calcium will go up, getting released from the sarcoplasmic radiculum. That calcium will then diffuse to the myofilaments and bind to troponin C. And in binding to troponin C on the thin filament and skeletal muscle, there are two binding sites, that will switch on the tropomyosin, causes the tropomyosin to shift out of the way of binding sites on the thin filament or myosin. So normally the tropomyosin covers up the sites on actin where the S1 head of myosin can bind and attach. When calcium binds troponin C, through its interactions with troponin I and T, it has the effect of shifting tropomyosin out of the way enough for a crossbridge to attach. Actually, the crossbridge attaching further shifts the tropomyosin out of the way, which tends to then, because the tropomyosin's all sort of tied together, it tends to start to shift the tropomyosin in the neighboring regulatory units away. This is called cooperativity. The result of that is you actually get a very steep curve between the concentration of calcium inside the cell and the force developed. A curve like this, a biochemist would call cooperative because it's got a Hill coefficient that's greater than one. You might expect a Hill coefficient of two when you have two calcium binding sites, but in fact, the Hill coefficient is greater than two as well. And that's because of this cooperativity that's mostly mediated by the tropomyosin shift. So calcium binds to one troponin C, shifts the tropomyosin out of the way, a crossbridge can attach, shifts it a bit further, but now the neighboring regulatory units are more likely to be accessible by the next myosin down, and so they can attach even without another calcium binding event. So this steep curve here represents the fact that the activation of the thin filaments by calcium is, is quite steep and cooperative. It's not quite all or nothing, but you can see it goes in less than an order of magnitude change in calcium concentration. The force goes from zero to practically maximal. So you only have to go from a little bit less than a micromolar to a little bit more than a micromolar calcium, and you go from no force to maximal. Now, micromolar is a small amount of calcium. Outside the cell, there's millimolar calcium. So the inside of the cell is actually controlled to have very little calcium in the cytoplasm, and the calcium that is there is sucked up and stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum until it's needed, and then it gets released where it diffuses to the myofilament and triggers the contraction, and then it gets taken back up by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's the activation. So now once the crossbridge can attach, it still has to go through its own set of chemical steps in order to be able to generate force and also to then relax again. So the key is binding of the S1 head of the myosin to the actin to form what's called this cross bridge. And here's a sort of cartoon. You can see the S1 head here. You can see the tropomyosin in blue, the actin in yellow, and the, the green here is adenine nucleotide. So we have ATP, ADP, and inorganic phosphate. That's because the myosin contains an ATPase, that is a site that hydrolyzes ATP, splits off a phosphate, and then you get ADP and inorganic phosphate. And this hydrolysis of ATP is key to providing the energy for the work of contraction and for understanding this crossbridge cycle. So when the S1 head has had its ATP hydrolyzed, and that ATP is now turned into ADP and inorganic phosphate, which are still attached, it likes to bind to the actin. But so far, it hasn't really done anything. It's just attached. However, once it's bound to actin, its affinity for the nucleotides change. And so they get released. This diagram simplifies it by showing them both sort of being released at the same time. In fact, they get released sequentially. And that release then changes the energetic state of the crossbridge of the S1 head, such that it changes its conformation. And that change in conformation, which is shown here by the tilting of the head, is, is called the power stroke of the crossbridge cycle. And that's how muscle shortens, changes length. Because in undergoing this power stroke, it's going to pull the thick filament with respect to the thin filament, so they start to slide with respect to each other, and the muscle will shorten. Then, however, once it's gone through this power stroke, it's no longer has a high affinity for actin. So it now wants to dissociate. 
So the cross bridge comes off, but then, then ATP attaches and the hydrolysis takes place that recocks the head of the cross bridge for the next cycle. So in this way, the hydrolysis of ATP provides the chemical energy to do the mechanical work of the power stroke. And the cycle also ensures that the cross bridge not only attaches, but detaches so that it can reattach and continue to shorten the muscle. Because if all that happened was all the cross bridges attached and stayed there until you didn't need them anymore, then all that would happen is the muscle would get stiffer. But it wouldn't necessarily get shorter. And if it doesn't get shorter, then it can't function like a muscle and it actually also can't generate force because the way you generate force is you try and shorten but then you can't because there's some external load against it. So when we talk about the word contraction in muscle, we actually mean two things, either shortening or developing force or both. Possibly what you haven't considered though is that what turns out to be very important in the mechanics of the muscle isn't just what's going on down at the molecular and cellular scale but also the macroscopic organization of the muscle. So we tend to think of skeletal muscles as being like the biceps here, which are parallel fibered muscles in which the cells go all the way, almost all the way from one end of the muscle to the other, then they fuse into extracellular matrix that makes the tendons, and all of the fibers are more or less oriented in the same direction, and the function of that muscle is to develop force or shortening along a single axis, and because that insertion point of that axis force has some moment arm about a joint, then a muscle like this creates a moment. Actually, most muscles don't look like that. Most muscles, the fibers do not run parallel to the axes of the tendons, even though many of those muscles still function in the same way to generate force between the tendons. So why would that be? The collagen that organizes the muscle cells into fascicles is called the paramecium or the paramecial collagen. The collagen inside the bundles that connects individual cells to individual cells within a fascicle, within a bundle, is called the endomesium. And then collagen that's outside all of the bundles is basically the outer collagenous layer of the muscle, is called epimesium. The architecture of the muscle is a combination of the orientation of the myocytes into fascicles and the way the fascicles are organized macroscopically into a tissue that ultimately terminates on tendons. The parallel fibered organization is a simple intuitive one you've seen of, but in fact, many muscles are not oriented that way. So many of them, even the, the biceps, for example, are actually more tapered like this. Not all the fibers are exactly the same length. They narrow down, and this makes sense because you have to, you're gonna run out of room at the end of the joint. But then even more of them, uh, you'll often find have this type of arrangement. This one's called bipennate. So here, the tendon goes up the middle, and you can see the fibers are actually taking off at an angle. And in this case, by being bipennate, the resultant force direction is still this way. But for some reason, this orientation is preferred. Some are areola like this. Here's a sort of a more idealized example of a pennate arrangement or a bipennate arrangement. And the idea of this particular example is that imagine these two muscles, which were just made rectangular, imagine they have exactly the same volume. So there's the same number of sarcomeres in these two muscles. Their tendons will be oriented the same way. So ultimately, their job is to generate resultant forces or shortening along the same axis. But in this muscle, this bipennate muscle, there's a large pennation angle, alpha, relative to the axis of the tendon, whereas in the parallel fibered muscle, there's none whatsoever. You can see that one result of this is the way the muscle will shorten. It'll change shape in a somewhat different way. But there's a fairly basic difference between these two that boils down to the fact that contraction means two things, shortening and or developing force. So I wonder if anyone can tell me, look at this for a while, and think, what would you expect to be different about these muscles? The pennate arrangement favors the generation of more force at the expense of less shortening capacity. It can shorten, as this illustration shows, but actually it can, it can shorten less. More specifically, it can shorten slower. So we'll find out that the, the shortening property, the way we measure the capacity of a muscle to shorten is how fast it can shorten. But for the time being, it's good enough to say it can't shorten as much. It doesn't really matter. This muscle, on the other hand, can shorten faster, but actually it generates less force. Now, without actually proving this all mathematically, can anyone now say, what is the difference between these two that results in this type of arrangement generating m more force than this? 
And now you have to start to think about the sarcomeres a little bit. If you think about the sarcomeres as the basic unit of force development and or shortening, how would you arrange them if you wanted to maximize the shortening, particularly the speed of shortening and the amount of shortening, versus the force? So let's say you have the same number of sarcomeres. In one case, you want to generate more force. In another, you want to generate more shortening. What would you do differently? So that's the difference. If you put all your force generators in parallel, all their forces will add up, and they'll generate a lot of force, but they won't have as much capacity to shorten. If you put them all in a long line, they won't generate much force, because the force in all of them will be the same as force in one. But now they'll be able to, all their shortening will add up. So a parallel arrangement of sarcomeres adds up the forces. A serial arrangement adds up the amount of shortening or the speed of shortening. The problem with putting them all in parallel and keeping them in a block like this is that now you'd have a muscle that was sort of wide and fat and wouldn't fit. So the pennate arrangement allows you to put most of your sarcomeres in parallel, take advantage of symmetry such that you get more force generation at the expense of less shortening capacity, whereas the parallel fiber gives you faster shortening at the expense of less maximum force generating capacity.